And yeah, like I, I overtook David Coulthard and got punted off by Nico Rosberg. So like, what, what more can you ask for? Really? Not many people can uh, say that. But actually what real racing did for me was gave me a real appreciation of how close the Sims get to that feeling. Mm. I don't care if you came to Formula One because Charles Leclerc is a handsome man. Uh, I mean, he is. Uh, yeah, know, he just, is. Yeah, just that true. just means you have functioning eyeballs. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to The Cool Down, the second episode of 2021. And again, we've got another guest that I have enjoyed their work for many a time. I'm sure many of you watching have as well. Co-founder of Outside Xbox, boasting over 2.5 million subscribers. Um, if you've got the plaque, I would like to see it. But it's in know. Andy's it's house, actually. He's stolen that oh, one. Oh, is it? But I guess I'll How's just have he to, done that? I have to take the 10 million one when we eventually crawl <laughs> our way to 10 million. Congratulations on yours. Thank you. Congratulations actually, on your I've got mine here. Go on. Yeah. Sorry, there you I, go. This podcast meant to be all about you, but actually I'm going to make it's it fine. about me at the start. Look at that. that. Whoa, bling, bling. You can see yourself. It looks, it looks better than it used to, actually. Look, there you are. Can you see yourself? Wait, have you got your 100K? No, James got one. Oh, uh, what the hell, man? What what happened? It's all right. I don't. I don't need. I don't need the. I don't need the baubles. You don't. I've got you... the. I've got the. Uh, I can just look at the look at the subscriber number. <laughs> you feel somewhat good about number. myself. <laughs> well, maybe maybe it's because you've got the you've got the G forty. You've got the Ginetta. So um, mm. you, maybe you... I would much rather have a race car. Certainly. Maybe <laughs> it's of course my channel. Well, Hello. first of all, it's channel, isn't it? Not Chanel. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, the fine. amount yeah. of times I've seen it pronounced Chanel, like. But I don't, I don't correct people because it makes, well, yeah, it makes me feel sound all sophisticated and stuff, like the perfume. <laughs> so I don't correct people when they say it. But um, you know, but, yeah. was it is it one foot in the grave when it's bucket and bouquet? Is, uh, is keeping up right? appearances, I think it was, it was called. It? Yeah, hi, hi got, since bouquet. Yeah, that's it. But that's it's bucket, it. Yeah. That's you. Um, well, for, that's me. how are you, Mike? How are you doing? I'm the, good, the obligatory yeah. opening question. Staying healthy. I'm on holiday this week. I've got the week off because um, it's my birthday so nice. uh yeah yeah i'm i'm having a good time yeah is it your birthday today not today no okay. I, you're important but not that important i was gonna Tom. say so, i was like, uh, wow okay he's a yeah, big fan it's, clearly <laughs> um it's on thursday so uh, nice yeah. oh well, happy birthday for them mate Thank if you, you got yeah. i mean i was gonna because i had my birthday a week ago today um oh, nice. so birthday. did you do anything fun uh, we've ordered in some like uh, sort of special ordering food type stuff. So we're getting some poutine, which is Canadian uh, junk food, which is amazing. Nice. There's a place called the Poutinery that does Ooh. does it delivery basically. And it's so good. I've, so I'm not aware that. of Canadian. Like, what is it exactly? It's, it is. Uh, this is this is going to undersell it, but it's chips, cheese, and gravy. But basically, it's uh, yeah, that it's, sounds it's, phenomenal, mate. Yeah, I'm not gonna it's, lie. it's lovely, lovely <laughs> chips. Uh, a sort of spicy, peppery kind of gravy. And okay. cheese curds, which are like kind of squeaky, cheese curdy type things. Uh, it's delicious. Mm. So it's, instead of going for a kebab, that's what Canadians go for when they're a little bit tipsy. Interesting. I have to keep that in mind if I'm going to Canada later this year. Hopefully, mm. fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, have you got like Have you got like an outdoor space where you are, or are you quite kind of? Stuck yeah, we inside? moved. Fortunately, we moved like last year, basically. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, the, no, <laughs> it was the year before actually, but the entirety oh of last year is a blur. But yeah, basically about a yeah, year ago, a year and a half ago, we moved to a place with a garden. And I'm so glad we did because like the, the lockdown stuff without an outside space during the summer would have just been horrible. So and I, I really feel for, for anyone who's like going through sort of COVID lockdowns with, with no outdoor space of their own. So It's not fun, yeah. is it? It's mate? a little but garden, but it is, it, yeah. it is a garden. So. Well, the, the world has gone on and, and the thing is, I guess, for, for, for both of the kind of content that you create and the kind of content that I create is that mm. obviously this world situation has look there's there's more people wanting to consume content online than ever i mean have you have you yeah. noticed any have you noticed any change in the number of people maybe the are people yeah. commenting more i don't know what, what, it, have you seen it anything? had a we got a kind of there was a bit of an up upswell when the first lockdown happened mm. i think because a lot of people were kind of stuck at home with nothing to do um it's sort of leveled off again and um, yeah uh, and so i don't think you know i think overall we haven't really like done better or worse out of it really mm. um but i think for us certainly as the creators it's been tough you know like we we used to record stuff in a studio we don't do that anymore because we're not you know it's not safe to get together mm. um and i think just generally not being able to leave the house and stuff can can make working from home just like makes every day feel the same and that can, that sure. can sort of take a bit of a toll so uh, i i think probably we we've you know we took a hit probably in that regard like just personally but mm. um 
but I think we're coming into sort of 2021 with a kind of a goal of kind of working smarter rather than working harder and trying to just make the most of what we've got and, and what we're doing and, and that seems to be going well so far we've had a good start to the year so um yeah looking yeah. forward to 2021 and I've had motorsport to keep me sane throughout the the lockdown period which I wasn't expecting I wasn't I was gonna say expecting you know uh to have an f1 season to watch or, <laughs> or a Le Mans or a Indy 500 or any of this yeah stuff. for sure so, um, I'm and, thankful and for everyone not to places. mention all of the stuff that you've personally been involved in as well but yes yeah I did some, we are gonna some touch some on that stuff. don't yeah. you worry we are definitely <laughs> gonna touch on that because I'm, I'm very very envious not gonna lie. I don't even have a sure. wheel I, I I need to get oh, the to sort me out with a rig because yeah, you do. Yeah, that's yeah. a long time coming. <laughs> but anyway, for I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's going to be some people who maybe don't, not to not to be rude, don't know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> what's the what's the sell? Like, what is it that um, outside Xbox do? Essentially? Uh, so we uh, have been running for eight years now. We're Sp- kind of that's o- old old ass YouTube channel, basically. Um, but yeah, we've been we've been doing gaming video for um, a really long time. Uh, I guess the thing we're most famous for and where you might have seen us is kind of like list feature type mm-hmm. things. So we do a lot of videos oh, yes. that are sort of seven things kind of um, titles. So that that's the stuff we, we pour a lot of sort of time and effort into scripting those and recording them and, you know, capturing all the footage and things like that. So, yeah, it's um that's the big stuff. But we also play games. We live stream from time to time. And then outside of that, I've got a sort of personal interest in motorsport. Um since I was a kid, uh, I've always loved cars, always loved, you know, racing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I sort of on the side have done uh, some bits in kind of I write for Top Gear and do their their sort of gaming reviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, I bought a race car a couple of years ago um, and raced for a season um, and, and did a video with a YouTube channel called Carfection who make amazingly beautiful sort of um, car videos mm-hmm. uh so i worked with them to, to do this documentary about me going on my first season of racing embarking on that um yeah all sorts of other stuff really just just a big big motorsport head um it's what it's how i kind of unwind um at the end of a long day exactly uh, it, it's nice seeing you fly the flag on because yeah, have you had any luck converting uh Jane or Andy into, into motorsport at all? Or not really. Not. We've done the odd thing. Like we, one of the, uh, we did a live stream for one of the F1 games where we <laughs> got Jane to, to drive in a proper sim rig and it was nice. disastrous to be honest. Um, <laughs> but it was quite entertaining. Um, so we've done that sort of thing. And, um, but yeah, they're not, they're, they're sort of very nice about it, but not mm. particularly interested. Themselves. Well, the thing is you've all got your own niches, you know? You've yeah, all got of your course. Own, and yeah, that's yeah, nice. Yeah. You kind of work well together. But so Absolutely. in terms of the motorsport kind of ick, the bug, where mm. did that first, did it come from, you know, your family? Was it, do you remember, what, like what's your first kind of memory of motorsport and how you think that all kind of started for you? Yeah, I think it's that it's that classic thing, which I think is the same for a lot of us, which is just my dad had it on on Sunday afternoons. Mm. So, like, I think, you know, when I was a kid, I was sort of interested, but not like I didn't have the focus to sort of sit down for an entire yeah. Grand Prix. But it yeah. was as I... Most adults older. don't, let alone kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, you know, I think that... And, and I remember watching other motor racing, like, you know, rally stuff. I've got really, like... Mm vivid memories of watching rally when i was a kid because it was much more like it was televised mm-hmm. much more back then uh touring it cars really, things yeah. like that um so so yeah it was it was just a, since i've been a kid but i would say that um and again it's it may be the case for you if you watch our our youtube stuff um it's always been kind of intertwined with with video games as well mm-hmm. so i used to play a lot of racing games play a lot of gran turismo uh Tucker, oh, yes. you know yeah cray all that stuff yep. back in the day um and that that kind of the two things kind of fed off each other so like i I discover an amazing racing series and then i'd go and try and find the official game for that racing series or i'd find an amazing racing car in gran turismo like and i'd be like well what the hell's super gt and i'd go and look look up you know that and discover this sort of japanese motorsport that i had no idea about before but was kind of you know blown away by so it's always been kind of the two have kind of been symbiotic basically yeah, throughout my course. entire life so um so yeah it's uh it, it it's it's kind of fun it's a sort of separate thing that i can indulge as a, mm-hmm. as a sort of pastime um but it it is connected to video games as well and i get to you know we're, we're so fortunate to to have racing games and if you do have a steering wheel um you can you know you can basically replicate so much of the experience of racing Absolutely. cars um in your, more in than your any other sport like yeah. so much closer which is so yeah. unique about it, isn't it 
Exactly. You know, you can't play FIFA and feel like you're getting better at football, <coughs> but you can play a racing nope. game with a steering wheel and feel like you're getting better at racing. So, yeah, we're very fortunate that our sport just happens to translate sort of perfectly mm. to, to video games. Was, was there a particular game that sticks in your mind? Like when you think about childhood game, because for me, yeah. there's, uh, again, I feel like we, we're kind of similar kind of generation. So mm. I feel like what I'm trying to remember the Toka, I think it was the second one, Toka Touring Cars. And... Mm fours are three they're they're my two they're my two main ones but what were what are the titles that stick in mind most for you back yeah as a I, kid? I think um i think like gran turismo i was i was like of the sort of generation that had a had a ps1 when i was quite young um yep. uh, and so like gran turismo 2 i think was a just a huge one for me to be honest um uh, just the the sort of variety and, and depth of that um and then like you know pc stuff like grand prix 4 i, I played a lot of f1 wise i played a lot of um uh it's called f1 challenge 99 mm -hmm. to 02 so it's like it was released oh, yeah. in 2003 but um ea had lost the license so they they <laughs> created like a, they just created like a bundle of nice. like the previous four seasons but Brilliant. it was also like the um the guys who make R Factor now, it mm. was that, or or you know who designed R Factor, um, it was their game, and so it was a really like quite hardcore F one simulation. It was really really good, and I sort of felt like I'd stumbled across like a weird secret mm. that there was this F one game that not many people had played because they were all playing the PlayStation ones. But it was like really hardcore, and although it wasn't the latest season, people were like modding in the two thousand three season, so it felt yeah, fresh. Yeah. It was really really good. So yeah, that was my that was my like F one game that I really put put time into. And I guess like outside of like, was it mainly racing games for you when you were younger or were you, I wouldn't say that, was that just I, one genre of many? Yeah. I, you know, I, I've always loved them and I've always been interested in them, but um, yeah, I, I've played all, all sorts of games and I think that's, that's kind of reflected in what we do in outside Xbox. Mm. Like a lot of our um, content, those, those list features are based on our kind of collected knowledge of like all sorts of genres of yeah of games and i used to read like gaming magazines as well so like even if i hadn't played stuff i kind of was aware of it and knew of it so that's why that's why i've ended up doing what i'm doing basically because i i just have that like quite wide knowledge of, of video games yeah. as a whole but yeah racing games have always been a a priority and i think i feel like back when i was a kid like i feel like racing games were like a bigger genre than they are now and like more of a kind of mainstream genre so like you know how yeah, nowadays it's like it's like call it you know for years call of duty was like the christmas number one video game right? yeah but i remember when like need for speed underground came out like need for speed underground 2 was christmas number one and it's like that's a racing yeah. game that had sold the most in the uk you're right actually um so i feel like i don't know like racing racing games have got this amazing like hardcore scene now and, and like sim racing is massive and things like that but i feel like as a genre like racing games aren't quite as like widely played as they used to be so maybe it's I don't, know. I don't know if maybe like it's because titles like fifa immediately comes to mind has almost yeah. like stolen that attention mm. i don't know mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult and obviously when we grew up as well there was no social media so it was very difficult to understand what was going on outside of our own yeah. kind of little biosphere right I, mm. maybe that's it yeah yeah perhaps it could be could be any any number of factors really but i do think it's yeah. kind of interesting that like certainly when i was a kid it was like everyone you knew had a racing game like whether they cared about motorsport yeah. and racing or not whereas For now sure. it's like you know they've probably got call of duty they've probably got fifa um and that might be it so well there's there's something that there's something of a universal appeal i think to not not necessarily racing games but racing ca cars like you look at a, you know you have the um the hot laps that go out before every F1 race and you get a celebrity jumping in and yeah, like, yeah. everyone gets a, there's something like visceral, like mm. from that experience of going in a racing car that is, is so unique. Like if, if you chuck anyone a football pitch to, for a kick around, then just be like, oh, if they're not interested, they're not interested. Yeah. But I feel like every, everyone's going to respond in some way, whether it's positive or, or negative. Yeah. Cause it's a very <laughs> physical experience. Yeah. And I think and I, you terrifying. You, mentioning that actually reminds me that the, the exception to the rule is Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo still sells, bazillions mm. of copies so that's still popular enough but um but yeah yeah video games and cars that's that's me basically i guess yeah because obviously because it started so early it's just kind of embedded mm. itself in in the in the psyche of everyone but mm -hmm. okay so a lot of many many kids love video games you're one of a huge amount of people and you're like your age my age yep. love video games but very few then take that and make it a career so yes. for you when was that was that always the plan? Like when you were at school, did you, cause I remember like literally there's a, my mum got it out the loft. Um, 
when I saw her a few weeks ago and it was something I'd written when I was in year maybe four and mm. I'd, ri- I'd written that I want to be a video games designer and I'd come up with all these horrific, I can't remember any of them, <laughs> but like titles for video games. Yeah. yeah. It's like, like James McDark, like the wow. fastest racer. I was just, oh, the cringe, mate. <laughs> but like, so w- when, did that, when did that become like a real thing for you that you were like, no, I'll, I actually really want to pursue this? Um, I think the main thing for me was like, I wanted to be a writer, right? And mm. I didn't really mind what I wrote about, like as long as I was interested in it. So uh, I was obviously very interested in video games, um, but I was also interested in motorsports. So the the re- real sort of turning point for me was being at uni in my final year of uni. I spent like, I did a lot of like uh, non extracurricular stuff in the first two years of uni. Mm. Like I was just mainly drinking and things oh of um, course oh, i know the thing um, right? where did you go my, uni by the way uh sussex down in brighton oh so. oh nice really i yeah. went bournemouth so oh nice i very the nearly went there actually they had a really good script writing mm. course and I, but i decided against like specializing like i said mm. i kind of was interested in writing in general but wasn't sure yeah. exactly what i was going to do nice. um my final year i was like oh gosh i'm like i'm leaving uni soon i should probably do a bunch of stuff so i did a bunch <laughs> of theater stuff uh and i did the student newspaper and i, I did the game reviews for that um so I, I started writing game reviews there and that was kind of my, my sort of starting point. But at the same time, I entered a, um, there was a, a competition called Bridgestone E-Reporter, which was sponsored by Bridgestone, who were an F1 tyre supplier at the time for Ferrari and Sauber, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, so they were, they were, um, they were sponsoring this, this uh, competition to find like young motorsport journalists. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I did this, uh, I entered this competition and like basically won, I was one of the seven finalists from across Europe. Uh, wow. And that, that took me to my first F1 race, which was the uh, Italian Grand Prix, which was amazing. It's like late September, beautiful uh, sunshine. Yeah. Um, I was covering GP2. That was the sort of competition was because they were the GP2 tire supplier as well. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of reporting on that stuff. And then I won that and got to go to the Tokyo Motor Show as well. Um, wow that's the sort of prize so that was amazing like final that's year of incredible uni. absolutely blown away um but that was kind of so at that point i was kind of like well i'm either going to write about racing or i'm going to write about like video games basically okay. uh and in the end i ended up getting an internship on a magazine called pc format which does not exist anymore but i was there and i was writing game reviews and tech reviews and things like that so that's the path i kind of chose and that's what's brought me sort of around to to now gaming youtube but i started out as a writer and that's why mm-hmm. Uh, you know a lot of the stuff we do on outside xbox like the three of us all all started out writing basically so that's Mm -hmm. why it's quite heavily scripted but i think good quality hopefully uh, as well so oh for sure so yeah that's um that's my path yeah yeah, that comes through massively in what you guys do because yeah it's that's the thing that it's such a like so many people want to get into that industry but it's very difficult to to Mm. kind of know the path it's like so at one stage i was thinking of going into motorsport kind of engineering and working like at college that's what i studied but i really should have gone down like the tends to be people if you go down like the aerodynamics path then Mm. that's the route in and it's difficult to because because i feel like like journalism as a whole is difficult to get into let alone yeah video game journalism because i i there, there was a talking of bournemouth there was a I think there was an Xbox magazine based in Bournemouth. There was, X360. Yeah. yeah. Called. Is that who you... Did you work for them at one stage? No, I, I worked for the official mm-hmm. Xbox magazine, which was that's in London. Um, so yeah. that's where I went after Peter. So Peter. were they like your rivals? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> But like friendly rivals. Like we okay. saw them at events and stuff. We were like, hey, how's it going? You know, it was all very yeah. chill. Like it wasn't yeah. really like hard fought or anything. It was just mm. like a bit of gentle ribbing. From, nice. Uh, from of course. Time, what was, so. so what was your, what was your first... When you first got that position outside yeah. of university and first got, what was that experience like? Like, do you remember your like first day? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty overwhelming to be honest. Because I'd read, I'd read the magazine a bunch. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The weird, the weird thing was, it was like on the, f- I bought a copy of the magazine for the flight to Tokyo, and I was reading it, and that's where I saw the internship. So it was a really weird like uh, okay. sequence of events and stuff. But yeah, I'd like <laughs> met a bunch of people who I whose stuff I'd read for uh, ages and really mm. admired. Um, I started out pretty. I guess pretty green and 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 I think my writing improved massively from you know working alongside people and getting feedback from them um and and yeah it was just great it was a great environment to work in awesome sort of office and stuff Mm. um yeah it's good times man um you know I was living the dream and and still am to be honest but um I've been very fortunate you know I like had a lot of lucky breaks and I think Mm. 
you know regardless of how talented you are and stuff you need the you know you need things to fall your way as well and i i've just been very very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time a, yeah. a few times in my career basically well i was going to say cuz again so many people have aspirations and mm. you know the idea of getting into a position that kind of you are in terms of your work like i noticed that it's a cliche question but what words is there anything you would maybe it's not even what would you advise people but is there anything that people you think typically maybe neglect that they could be doing more of because for me like a lot of people come to me and say how how can i do more of this it's just like being a bit more proactive and like creating content yourself and putting yourself out there a bit more but yeah yeah what would you I think say that's, that's good advice um i think certainly with something like youtube and i suspect the people i'm talking to who used to be like i would really want to write for a video game magazine mm. they're now saying i'd really like to set up a youtube channel and that's that's cool and it's very competitive but like um i would say the thing that you've just got to do is demonstrate a kind of commitment and and you know just keep making content and keep improving because the way mm. you'll improve is by making stuff absolutely uh, and I, I look back at Trial you know the, the things we the things we made as, as like early doors on outside xbox were i look back on them and i'm like wow this is this is awful you know like uh all the all the kind of commentary and stuff is really like lifeless yeah. and you mm -hmm. know all that kind of stuff and at the time it seemed okay but mm. like um we've developed so much from you know um from those those early days so that's the way you do it you you learn by doing and um it's just about having the persistence and the perseverance to 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 keep making stuff when you're getting like tiny numbers of views and you know mm, the, the needle absolutely. doesn't seem to be moving because what you got to remember is you're you're also investing in yourself and as you get better you will find your audience you know and if you're making stuff that you're passionate about there are other people who are passionate about it out there you just need to find them so um so yeah i would i would say it's just Very true. Uh, you know certainly with youtube it's about persistence basically just keep making that content keep improving and keep even banging on that door yeah and when it, even when it seems like really hard work like mm. that break may come you know um come from anywhere point. for sure yeah. for sure wise words you can tell you can tell this is a this is co-owner of a 2.5 billion youtube um subscriber <laughs> yeah. but okay Just so someone who's been doing it for too long basically. exactly yeah. well that's, that's it that's it but you're right like you should be looking back at those videos and thinking they're rubbish because that's the that's the side of progression yeah like of e course. even even in my short period of, of of this channel like i look back at something i'm like what are you like what is that framing like even something <laughs> like that it's just i'm just yeah but um but okay so you went from working in the publishing world to then setting up the channel and i, and I have yep. i have heard i think you guys talking about kind of the found the starting like mm -hmm. how that how the channel started but i guess yeah just for anyone who doesn't know like what what made you um jane and andy decide to go from that world where you're getting a guaranteed paycheck every week working mm. where you are to going it alone making the big risk because it is it was a huge yeah, yeah. it must have been a big risk at the time yeah we um we so we were all uh in different places i was working for official xbox magazine jane was at GameSpot, which is a big mm -hmm. website uh obviously and Andy had been working at Microsoft um, on a thing called Inside Xbox, it's like videos on the on the console, basically. Um, and Microsoft shut Inside Xbox, and so Andy was kind of without a, a place to go. But it had been very mm -hmm. popular, and so we uh, we were actually ap approached by um, some guys at Gamer Network uh, or Eurogamer, as it was called then, mm -hmm. um, uh, who who sort of said, "Well, we'd like to sort of you know kick." kickstart this sort of you know fund this invest in this uh thing and, and have you guys do what inside xbox was but on youtube which is mm -hmm. why we've got a really dumb name outside xbox is because back in 2012 it seemed like a really good idea to to make it a kind of like almost continuation um it just doesn't mean anything now um but yeah so um, it's become its own brand though isn't it yeah it has yeah 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 I, I mean you know i'm sure if you look at a bunch of stuff like the names of things now you're like <laughs> actually that's a really dumb name but once once people have gotten used to it the amount of times different. you go onto like um youtube urls because you can't change or well, i think yeah, you yeah. can but that, that that original url is yeah, yeah. i think like philip defranco's one is some really strange cringe thing i can't yeah. remember what it is but um yeah fair enough <laughs> like ali ali a was matroix for like a billion years <laughs> and then he, i think he finally got it changed um yeah but yeah so um there was this opportunity and mm. uh you know andy was setting this up and it, they were like well do you want to put a team together uh and he approached uh me and jane about it and and we we thought we'd take the jump because you know at the time i was working in magazines i was having a great time 
great job, loved it, enjoying myself. Um, but it was kind of obvious that magazines were kind of going like this, and YouTube was kind of going like this. So it seemed like a good, a good. It was risky, but it seemed like a good, good yeah, risk to take. Time and, to jump ship. And we were fortunate that we had a bit of funding for, to get through that kind of like first year of uncertainty yeah. with a bit of money coming in, so we could focus on it full time. Um, and yeah, we, you know, by the end of that first year, um, it was clear that that people were interested in what we were doing, and you know, mm. we were doing a good job, and we'd we kind of captured something on on YouTube. So um, yeah, we carried on, and here we are now. Here you are today. So how yeah. did you? How would you three guys met each other? Did, was it just through like yeah, through know, events? You know, events, I was saying yeah, like yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, I was saying like it was all very very friendly. You know, so yeah, yeah. we were matey with the guys down in Bournemouth. I was friendly with the Gamespot lot, um, including Jane. Um, and we, at the, as the official Xbox magazine, we had a really close relationship with Microsoft. So that's how mm-hmm. I knew Andy because we were publishing videos on, on the console as well, um, via those guys. So, um, so yeah, we just, you end up socializing a lot when there's a lot of events and things and, you know, there are a lot of parties in the kind of video game. Well, there were <laughs> before COVID, but, um, <laughs> there are a lot of parties in general. Yeah. Um, and so you end up socializing with, with people, uh, who work in the same industry. So that's how mm. we all knew each other. We all got on really well. So. It nice. just made sense, really, to be honest. Yeah. We were all making video as well. That's the thing. Mm. Jane was making video at GameSpot. I was making it at Official Xbox Magazine for the console. And mm-hmm. and so, you know, it made sense as a team. So w- had you been in front of camera before you started? Yeah, that? but not like, again, like I said, like we were all, you know, we'd all been in front of camera, but yeah. we've all still improved massively. So mm. I'd been doing... How did you find that like at first? Years. Like... Was it quite a? Was it something I, you wanted to do, or was it something you kind of felt you had to do? You know what I mean? Like yeah, I I wanted to. Like I said, when I was in my third year at uni, I did a bit of sort of theatre stuff mm. and stuff. So I've always been a bit of a a bit of a show off. Um, bit of an Amdra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, so I was quite happy to do the the in front of camera yeah. stuff, but I wouldn't say I was like particularly good at it to start with. But you kind of learn learn as you mm. go along but again like i look back at those old videos and i'm like wow this is so emotionless and like mm. like low key i think the thing about you know a, a more generalized like youtube tip is you have to be like 33 percent more like animated than you normally are <laughs> when you're talking to someone otherwise you just seem like the most boring person on the planet so yeah yeah it's uh, that you sort of get used to that stuff and you get used to kind of putting yourself out there in that way and mm. um and I kind of enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as a learning experience. And I thought it was important at the time for us to get videos in front of people on an Xbox to help support like sales of the magazine, basically. Yeah, so yeah. it was it was worth doing. I thought it was important. And uh, I was happy to sort of take responsibility for that stuff because it helped elevate me as well a little bit. So yeah, I was going to say, so in terms of the, the team, because it isn't just you three, right? You've got... Mm edit support like what what's what's the kind of behind the scenes because again obviously as consumers we only see the videos of course how how were your roles kind of different even just you andy and jane like how were your roles behind the scenes different do you have all certain things that you stick to or focus at um small things like small things we like some of us are better at like jane's really good at putting thumbnails together so she tends to kind of take the lead on that i'm kind mm-hmm. of good at the tech side so like when we're sorting out a lot of like um live stream kind of stuff i was i was kind of taking the lead on that tech side of things Mm -hmm. um but by and large we all write we all present and we all edit um we do less editing than we did just because it's kind of it makes a lot more sense for us to be doing the writing and presenting stuff than the the editing but you'd be surprised by how sort of small the team is to be Mm -hmm. honest so we've got um there's me andy and jame and we've got a guy called james hills who uh sort of does cameraman stuff and editing for us um and he kind of takes care of outside xbox stuff and then on outside extra the second channel we've got luke and ellen who write mm-hmm. and present stuff um, i think they're great as well i think yeah. they, were re- they were two really good additions when you brought because yeah. how long have they been with the i the think team? it's three years yeah. I think it's like three years now, really i still crazy, remember yeah. that first I've, i think i remember the first video that ellen was in watching mm. it years ago it's crazy yeah it's so they, been they've been great and they, they've yeah. got you know, such great personalities and such great chemistry. It was just, you know, we knew it'd be great though because we knew them both like outside of, again, from mm-hmm. socialising basically. Um, and we just knew they were really funny and, and, and that they'd get on well together because they hadn't actually met each other until they basically both agreed to join the channel. So oh, wow. <laughs> we sort of all got together in the pub and we're like, I hope this works, you know. Um, <laughs> it was fine. It was fine. Um, but yeah, they, they're great. Um, and then they have a, a producer called John who again does sort of bit of okay. filming a bit of editing but that's it you know like mm. outside extra is three people 
outside Xbox is four people. It's mm. like pretty small. Um, so yeah, that's that's us. I know a lot of other big, like really big YouTube channels have like, you know, their own offices that they own themselves, and they've yeah. got like you know tons of editors and thumbnail mm. artists and all sorts of stuff. But we're we're quite a lean. I, operation. I think yeah. I, I I don't know. Like I've I've experienced numerous times organizations, companies who they want to throw like TV levels of of budget yeah. and resource behind projects and they just flop like I, I used to do a lot of football stuff before mm-hmm. I, I started doing f1 and i'd been on a few shoots before and you see the man and they're just they're getting no views and it's like mm. how are they paying for all this because you're right like i think youtube as well because there's different expectations i guess maybe from the audience as well if you yeah. watch television you're expecting certain levels whereas with youtube i think there's a bit more flexibility to kind of create what you kind of want because ha- ha- i guess my question is, how has the outside Xbox vision, has that changed at all since you started in terms of like production value and stuff like that? Or has it kind of um, been quite consistent throughout? I think we always wanted to make something that looked like, certainly at the time when we set it up, we, we wanted it to look slightly better than your kind of average like bedroom shot sort of mm. thing. Um, and we we did have a studio and we, we rented a studio, which I guess was our big sort of expense. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've never been that kind of TV sort of grade production where you've got you know producers and runners and mm. catering and all that kind of stuff because we've always you know wanted to spend money sensibly like and, and spend it on the content rather than mm. like the, the peripheral stuff um, I think probably what's happened is um, since we started we've been going eight years I think the production quality of everything on YouTube has kind of gone up so it's true. Yeah. There's, there's less of that differentiating factor and certainly now that we're just stuck in our you know bedrooms basically <laughs> um it, 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 you know there's that's kind of leveled the playing field a bit i suppose but um but yeah from the start we wanted to make something that was it was never going to be tv quality but it was going to mm. be closer to tv quality than most of the stuff on youtube and i think that really helped us in the early years but i think everything's caught up now and, and you know there are people who film stuff in their bedroom and they have you know the amazing like cameras and the you know depth of field and the fairy lights behind them and it looks amazing and it's brilliant so it um, very like, fair yeah. play yeah um fair play but uh yeah that that was us and and we've always wanted to make kind of editorial led you know scripted mm. stuff um we it's just because we happened upon the kind of list feature format that really mm. took off um but there was a while when we were making stuff that wasn't list features it was just sort of you know, yeah previews and reviews and that kind of like old school sort of magazine stuff which actually doesn't mm. work that well on youtube but again like you say you've got to try these things to then learn from yep. them because that that leads on quite nicely actually to i was gonna ask kind of was is there a particular obviously there's not going to just going to be one but was there a particular video or a particular maybe series that the first time where the channel really started to you were like oh okay maybe we're onto something here mm. you know what i mean like w- was there a particular piece of content that kind of sticks in your mind you know it's it's really interesting I, I, and i think this is like a strength rather than a weakness but we've never really had like a viral success mm-hmm. so we've never had a uh, one video that's gone like completely ballistic and i know like a lot of youtube sort of channels are founded on that that one video that's gone gone absolutely bonkers and mm-hmm. and and that's brought a load of people in um our stuff has always been kind of steady growth but as a result we've got like hundreds of videos that have done over a million views like hundreds of them mm. um and and that that's just kind of testament, I think, to the fact that we found a format that works and like a quality level that that kind of just works and and does well. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, we have got vid- some videos that have have done like big numbers, but they've never done it in a big spike at the beginning. Yeah, it's always yeah. been like steady growth. Um, so yeah. well, virality can be dangerous as well at mm. times because I, I feel like what you've been able to do is create a really loyal you know invested audience that has stuck around mm. with the channel for for years now i mean do, do you have like do you still are there any names that still pop up sometimes in the comments that you're like oh i remember you from 2013 when we started the channel um yeah occasionally yeah yeah i mean there are yeah there are sort of um fans and commenters that that have stuck around for that amount of time and it's always really gratifying when they're still watching you yeah, eight yeah. years down the line and they say things like well you know when i started watching you i was like a a teenager and now i've just graduated like grown up with you and you're like yeah, yeah it's like that's that's bonkers and, and and super flattering um but yeah it's um 
it, it, yeah, we've built up a, a loyal fan base and, and um, it's great when people stick around. But I also love when people say, I just found you guys and mm. I love it and I've binged a load of videos. And I'm like, well, well, you must great. think like you've been doing it for this long and you've got this many subscribers. It must think, oh, is there anyone else out there that, and then all of a sudden yeah. another name pops up of, oh, I just found you, you know? Yeah, yeah, that is that is nice, definitely. I think certainly our, our sort of subscriber numbers have slowed down and I think there's a lot, of, there's a sense that like, you know, anyone who's, interested in our stuff has probably found our stuff by now and has probably already clicked subscribe but um but we're still doing good views every every month and you know that's um uh, you know that's that's sort of satisfying to us i don't think we can complain at all with the with the numbers we get there they're you know i'm sure there are a lot of youtube channels out there would that would love them so <laughs> oh, yeah we're, sure. we're still having fun i think that's the main thing you know we're making stuff we're proud of and mm. um hopefully more people will find it uh, you know mm. as time goes on and I'm sure there's, I, I don't really need to ask this, but, you know, in terms of future plans, there's, mm. I, I can't imagine you're going to, you know, massively change up what you're doing because it works at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, I think we're, we're always trying to look at, um, you know, sort of new formats and things that, you know, if we could find something else to make, uh, and we do have some ideas, uh, but find some stuff to make that, that would be as successful as the list videos, but a bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, we'd we'd love to make it. Um, we've also been doing weird stuff like tabletop things. Like we play D and D now, which is mm -hmm. not something I I really had any awareness of until about <laughs> two or three years ago. And then we started doing it, and people just absolutely loved it. Uh, mm. And we're having a lot of fun making it. So there's a bit of that stuff. Um, we used to do live shows when live shows were a thing, um, which was fun. Um, so there are bits and bobs that we we sort of do. But um, I think the main thing is just keeping ourselves interested and, and as long mm. as we're still enjoying ourselves, then I'm sure we'll be making stuff that people are, uh, that resonates with people as well. Well, that's what's nice, I, I guess, about having a small team because you mm. can be much more kind of reactive, but also... Yeah, agile, a, yeah. It's a bit more of a family, isn't it, right? Sure, there's not yep. the, the shareholders who are calling the shots and not really connected to what you're doing. Like, you, yeah. you guys are the ones who create the content. You know better than anyone else like what you should be doing, right? Yeah, yeah, we've always... Um, yeah we've always been completely independent and we we do what we want basically um the, Which is unfortunately the dream. it works yeah basically yeah, yeah. so um so yeah it's, i think that's the the joy of youtube is that i i think i'd struggle to be i'd struggle to have a boss mm. <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah like, yeah, yeah. i'd struggle oh, to have someone else telling me what to do uh now for sure um, yeah so. I, no, I, I'm, I'm completely the same i don't plan on mm. like the youtube the audience is my boss from now on mm. <laughs> yeah, it's That's much better that anyway. way and they will tell you if you're doing doing things yeah obviously, but, exactly. uh, oh, oh they'll be the first like, the amount of mistakes <laughs> I make in my videos and straight away in the comments oh, I can't like, believe you got this boring game thanks YouTube for the one. engagement <laughs> yeah. in the comments <laughs> but okay so I've got one I've got one more question this isn't so much about outside Xbox this is just sure. a genuine question I've got regarding mm. the industry before mm. we get into your kind of sim racing stuff yep the the inability to get hold of the latest generation, whether it's PS5 or, or Xbox mm. Series, whatever, is that on purpose? No, I wouldn't have thought so. They want to. They want as many fans. They want because I feel like this happens every launch. There's just a, a, it's a been, lack it's of. It's been particularly consoles. yeah. It's been particularly bad this year though. I think there's a lot of like scalping going on, which is mm. is yeah dreadful. Price you know, like uh, you know, you look on eBay and there's PlayStation Fives going for a thousand pounds and stuff mm. and that's like you know that's not cool and I, I i do think the console creators have a responsibility to to deal with that stuff and, mm. and work out a system but um yeah how do you think they could deal with great. that though that's the thing how because i don't that's know if really the retailers do the retailers care enough to like they just want the money the retailers yeah the retailers are just like as long as someone's buying it yeah they're exactly. happy they, when they sell out instantly they don't really care but it's damaging to the it's but, damaging yeah. in some ways but also the exclusivity kind of makes it I don't know. There's there's that yeah, side I of think, marketing which is like the lack of availability just makes people want it more. I don't know. Yeah, but I, if you're Sony, like, and someone's selling a PlayStation for a grand, mm. even if someone buys it for a grand, they're not going to have any money to buy any video games. It's so you're losing true. out there. You know. Um, so I, I don't think it's I don't think it's in Sony and Microsoft's. I don't think it's like artificial scarcity to 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 make it feel like a premium product because they know they could shift these quite mm. easily um but yeah i think it's sad i think it's sad that um you know a bunch of people who would like a playstation 5 or an xbox can't get hold i of them. would love one but mm. i'm not paying a grand <laughs> no exactly i was really lucky i got um i mean i got sent a, an xbox because we've got a really close relationship with microsoft obviously we're an xbox channel mm -hmm. but um i bought a 
a PS5 digital edition and it arrived on launch day, no problems whatsoever. You know, I nice. um, bought it from Argos. It was like I was just happened to be awake at. at we've got a baby, and oh um, wow, I was awake at like five a.m. Yeah, and I'd yeah. heard that like Argos was going a day later than like Amazon and stuff right. in terms of their yeah. pre-orders. I was awake and I just <laughs> thought I'd check my phone at five a.m. and they were there and live. I was just like. Okay, I guess I'll buy one then. It went through. <laughs> I just spent like a month staring at this confirmation, going, "Is this definitely going to show up, or have I done something wrong?" But, but yeah, Do you... I don't. I don't think it's on purpose. I think. I think it would be better for Sony and Microsoft. If, yeah. If real. No, that makes sense. Their, their yeah. To be fair, yeah. That, there's not much they can really do about people mm. like buying to resell. I the same in loads of like in in terms of like limited edition trainers and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. the I same mean, thing going on. You could have. You know. You could have some sort of raffle. I guess. I, mm. I think that's. Is that somewhat how? Yeah, they they do do raffles stuff? a lot on on a lot mm. of like uh, fashion retailers for that to to kind yeah. of circumnavigate as best as they can. But yeah, it's it difficult. might be t- it might be time to do that with with consoles. It sounds mm. weird, but you know. Yeah, I mean that's that does seem like the only fair way. Unfortunately, mm. like, but any any anyone's up for it. But what I will ask as well, obviously, you, so you've got a PlayStation Five and yes. you've got the new Xbox. What like do you feel any? You must feel some kind of like loyalty to xbox as a platform like i don't know what how, how is how is that for you because now you're like you're so connected and tired in the, in the digital yeah. world to xbox you know what i mean i think my i wouldn't even really call it loyalty i just i find i find the xbox a really convenient platform like i like the way it works the way it functions i like all the all the backwards compatibility stuff all my friends on my friends list are on xbox so mm-hmm. like it's more like why would I move when all that stuff's already there and the continuity is there? Um, mm-hmm. But I, in terms of like brand loyalty, like I don't, I don't mind really. I think Xbox do a great job. I think PlayStation do a great job. I prefer, actually, prefer Gran Turismo as a as a sort of sim to mm-hmm. Forza Motorsport at the moment. Yeah. Um, I just think it's a you know it, I, the driving style suits me better. Um, mm-hmm. So. So yeah, there are there are things I like that PlayStation do uh, better. I think they do amazing sort of cinematic games, you know, story led stuff. Um, and and then there are things that Xbox Xbox does better. I think Game Pass is amazing, like it's an mm. amazing service. But I'm really, sure. I think people expect me to be more of a fanboy than I am. But like, <laughs> you know, you're not just wearing green all the time and just yeah, I do own some Xbox socks, but I was sent them. So <laughs> there you go, uh, not out yeah. your own pocket. Uh, so what was your one last question on Xbox? Sure. What is your favourite Xbox of all of them? Uh, I think. Probably the 360. Right? Yes, I mean, like the 360 was good, great. lad. Like uh, that was the card, that was that. the first Xbox I ever bought, and um, I just think the multiplayer was like so good yeah. compared to anything else out there. I still the use my 360 controller for uh, it's a great Mania. controller. It's a great know, controller. Great. Best controller. Best controller. Has, has sure. the thumbstick started to go weird yet? Has the, uh, has oh yeah, it's like rubbed off, off, and like this the cable uh, is like oh, hanging man. out. It's not great. It's probably going to give me electric <laughs> shock uh, <laughs> at some point. Yeah, iconic. What but yeah, this, yeah, the 360 just like multiplayer became like a, such a huge deal on that console. Yeah. And I think it was Xbox Live was just like it was the first to, to really do live properly, wasn't mm. it? Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember the COD lobbies back in the day? Oh yeah, oh God. yeah. I remember oh, the abuse. So. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk a little bit. Come on now, onto the sim racing side of things, and onto sure. the. This is a motorsport podcast, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I get, I get, just, I just walk, walk off on, on alternative <laughs> subjects all the bloody time. So I'm sure right. everyone watching is very used to it. Um, but okay, so I know you were involved um, in some of the esports shenanigans that went on at yeah, the start totally of was, yeah. lockdown. So for anyone who doesn't know, let, um, what what exactly what what exactly have you been involved in kind of this year that surely uh, you couldn't have even imagined like in your wildest yeah, yeah, yeah. dreams? You uh, know what I mean beforehand. So what I've been, uh, let me let me do the the full list. I did a, the, the first list. thing I did was a. Uh, race room uh this is my dipping my toe in the water and i mainly did this because i've got a friend who hates race room and loves eye racing and they were doing a <laughs> race room lockdown esports thing and so just to wind him up specifically my buddy pete i i entered into that and that was the first thing i did i drove a bentley gt3 around the nordschleifer luke crane nice. actual vision was commentating he's he's a really good esports commentator so that was the first thing and then um after that i was chatting to a friend of mine, uh, Sean, who works at Asus, who are like a mm-hmm. computer manufacturer. They make gaming PCs and, and stuff. Uh, and he was saying, well, we're partnering with Formula E and we've got a spot in this sort of warm-up race for their race at home challenge thing. And would you like to be involved? And I, I was like, yeah, absolutely. That sounds sounds brilliant fun. 
Um, so, so yeah, it was me and Jimmy Broadbent and Super GT, a couple of really big um, racing game content creators, um, all racing against a bunch of like really hardcore esports guys who are extremely quick and much, much faster. I'm, I'm like pretty average. I was gonna say, what's your skills. level? Do you feel pretty average? The, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm all, I'm all right. I can get it around the circuit mostly, but um, but it was, it was amazing fun. I mean, the pr- production on the Formula E stuff was incredible. Mm. Uh, they had the full commentary team. You know, Jack Nichols, Dario Franchitti. Uh, did, both yeah. absolute heroes, um, uh, particularly Dario. What a legend and what a dreamboat. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so they had those guys commentating on us and like Nikki Shields was presenting like on the TV show. Um, so yeah, that was really, really cool. And so I did that. And then um, because I think we brought, I, I was tweeting about it and, and sort of mentioning it on outside Xbox official <laughs> channels. And I think we brought in quite a few fans who were like cheering for me in the in the comments and stuff. So I nice. got invited back for a few more of those rounds. Um, which was awesome, really, really good fun, um, and and that was cool. I got to race against a few like real drivers as well, like Simone de Silvestro, who's a, a, a great racing driver, um, and who will be competing in the Indy 500, I think, this year. Uh, so nice. th- it was great to compete against her, and also just in the practice sessions, you know, it'd be like. Um, you know, you'd be sitting there and Felipe Massa would drive past you, you know. In but, it, these... but it's actually Felipe Massa. But it's it's actually, not a video yeah, game yeah. when no, it's, yeah. it's It's him. He's sitting somewhere in, <laughs> I don't know, Brazil, I guess, um, uh, you know, playing this stuff. Um, so that was bonkers. And then Heineken got in touch and said, we're putting together like a, a sort of celebrity, e- celebrity, esports <laughs> race. You're a celebrity thing. now, Mike. <laughs> mm, yeah, I, I wish I hadn't used that word. Actually, it's not accurate. But um, but it was a race against David Coulthard and Nico Rosberg, like mm-hmm. 2016 F1 World Champion Nico Rosberg and DC, who I like has been a favourite driver of mine mm. since I was a kid. So that was that was bonkers as well. Again, a bunch of kind of content, you know, F1 content creators uh, got together in this race. Um, and yeah, like I, I overtook David Coulthard and got punted off by Nico Rosberg. So like, what, what more can you ask for? Right? Not many people can uh, say that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a pretty exclusive club. So, um, so yeah, that was that was cool. And that was on F1 2020. Uh, 20, uh, no, 2019, because the game hadn't come out yet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was cool. And then finally, I did... Uh, you must know WTF1, the guys over there. I, did I used to work cha- for them, actually. Yeah. Just, just so three I, months, I, but... Yeah. I did their charity uh, race for Harefield Hospital. Um, Indeed, yeah. Which was great. And that was bonkers as well. Because like 1972 world champion Emerson Fittipaldi. Yeah. Oh my God. And yes. I'm like, that is like well before I was born. That guy was world champion. <laughs> and he's still doing it. And he's still he doing it. He was pretty good as well. He was not, not too bad until Jimmy Broadbent rear-ended him. As until, I recall. yeah. Classic Jim. Um, Classic Jim. But um, yeah, so like, yeah, those are the, those are all the kind of esports things I did. Um hmm over the course of lockdown and yeah bizarre amazing like i'm never going to be a f- professional racing driver but mm. for those for those events that was about as close as it close as it got you know for sure and do, do you feel do you feel that um since that's happened yeah and obviously i now that racing has returned and we're not back to normal yet but mm. do you think because because i i really feel that 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 moment that was seized on by everyone at the start with motor racing esports has ca- has pushed the industry forwards like five maybe even yeah, ten yeah. years in terms of the like do we do you think maybe now in the, in the next few months you might be getting some call ups for some more esports races because maybe, I feel like there's, yeah, there's an appetite it, for it now. It's difficult to know. Yeah, I, I you know I, I don't think I'm as big a draw as, as guys like Jimmy Broadbent and, and Super GT. Oh, you know, those, those guys it. are, but they, they, those guys have an amazing <laughs> like dedicated sim racing audience, so they they, they bring in a lot of. A lot of eyeballs who who are interested in that sort of mm. thing, but yeah, I feel like sim racing has definitely benefited. Um, I think you know I was uh, doing the i racing Daytona Twenty Four with some mates over the weekend, and i racing. I was watching that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. i racing crashed hard in the build up. Um, yeah, I know. How was it? How, how many hours was it delayed for? In the end? Four, I think. In the end, Ugh. I think. Our, and then you still did twenty four hours. Yeah, oh. exactly. Yeah, you've been sitting oh. in front of your computer for the next four hours, but um, but I think the fact that it crashed was like testament to the fact that mm. more people are interested and more people want to participate. So, um, yeah, I think sim racing is in a good place. It's good for us, you know, um, as fans of racing games, for that that scene to be healthy. And even if mm. we're not 
at the level of the real pros and they are so fast that was the thing i learned from the, yeah, the formula e thing specifically just the amount of speed they could extract from those cars it was like otherworldly um even if you're not at that level you can enjoy esports and you know mm. my my experience of i racing endurance events is getting together with a bunch of mates on discord you know we're all in the chat dropping in and out like someone's doing a stint you know you drop in have a look at how they're getting on give them a bit of like you know um morale boost and things and and, and it's like it's just a really nice like friendly sort of um social thing so yeah, yeah. I, I think it's great it's great that more people have been getting into it i think a lot of people have bought sim rigs and sim racing equipment during lockdown fanatech stocks must have just yeah gone. exactly <laughs> well you notice they're they're sponsoring G- the gt world challenge they now. are aren't they of, and gonna be, isn't there real points for yeah. a sim race yeah which I, I i don't know about it's weird i think you know as much as i love sim racing i i don't know about this like real points for sim races thing but um but yeah we'll see how it goes but yeah fanatech must be absolutely rolling in it which is fair enough because their good stuff is really good like I, yeah you know, for sure <laughs> i've used all sorts of racing stuff uh uh, but the Fanatec gear is is my absolute favourite. So. Well, I th- I think there is. Uh, I've been thinking a while now. There's definitely a video for me to make in this in terms of the whole how unique that that connection between the esport and the real sport is in mm. motorsport. Like it's I I can't think of another sport where you can get that same. Like someone like George Russell who doesn't really like obviously does his simulators at Williams, but can mm. jump into the F1 game and be almost as quick as the top esports people. Yep. And then you've got people like Igor Fraga or mm. James Baldwin who can take that ability. And yes, they are car in backgrounds, but still they they weren't like they... Because I think there's something in terms of it almost not replacing karting, but being... Because you can practice as much as you like. You don't have to worry about the, yep. the lights being on. There's not anywhere near the expenditure. Like yeah. how far do you think it can go? I guess. I mean, it, like you say, I think it, it can it can become a new sort of grassroots of motorsport. You know? A new route in. Yeah, because karting, even karting is expensive, you know, like... So expensive. And, and, and motorsport only gets more expensive from there. The difficulty is making the transition. And like still, I you know, I think although everyone, literally everyone in motorsport recognises now that sim... Sims and racing are 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 so close yeah. that uh, there are transferable skills, and you only have to look at like James Baldwin's performance in British GT. I watch a lot of British GT Man. because I when I raced, I was in the on the support category, so I I love the, that racing. I think it's the best local, like it's the best domestic GT league yeah. in the world. Um, and so to watch uh, James Baldwin come in, and I think he put it on pole in his first race at All yep. Park, and you're like. You know that that is just the ultimate validation. No one. And they won deny. that first race, yeah. didn't they? As well. Uh, I think yeah, one of one of the two at Alton Park. I think they won. So yeah. um, it's. It's crazy. I, I think it's it's, it's just about persuading um, manufacturers and and um, you just motorsport teams in general that it's worth investing in this talent that comes through and it's worth scouting for talent in games mm-hmm. because ultimately, like, I I would imagine the standard. Uh, in the top split of an i racing race for example would mm. be more consistently high than a an f3 race because yeah, yeah. in f3 you've got a bunch of people who are great obviously and they've made it through the meritocracy but you've also got a bunch of people who have paid to be there and are, yeah have the money yeah. and want to want to <laughs> live want to live that race and like fair play to them like it's exactly what i would oh, be doing i'd, I'd if, do the same if, thing if i was yeah. i'm sure you would as well <laughs> yeah exactly if my dad was a multi-millionaire like i would totally be racing Please, daddy, um, exactly. a racing car yeah so i don't no shade but, no um, of course but i think the standard in i racing like the i racing top split would be higher than an f3 100 percent. So, like, yeah you, you, even like I, i've been following uh f1 esports a lot over the last kind of couple of seasons yeah that the splits i remember it was it in austria and i think the split between uh in Q1 between P1 and bottom was less than two tenths, which is yeah. just yeah, like you say, it, it's it's there's such a there's such a barrier to entry to real life motorsport mm. with the finance, with the even if you've got money, if you're not near a karting track, if you don't have you know parents who yeah. are prepared to you know you, you look like not many people make it who don't have massively privileged backgrounds. So you're right, it, it, indeed. In yeah. terms of finding that, in in terms of finding that just natural talent that the likes of Hamilton and Senna and all these mm. amazing drivers have for that to also be, you know, put with, because 
a sport like football, you don't need a you know a wealthy background. You can yeah. show that ability in a park and then get picked up, and all of a sudden, but that just doesn't happen with motorsport, does it? Yeah, I think I think hopefully what will happen is teams will be spending more time looking at these iRacing talents and and looking at their race re- race records in mm. sims and saying, all right, how about we give these guys a, a test? You know, how Got how about we give them a trial? Yeah, see, sure. just see. Some of them will fall by the wayside. Mm. Some of them won't be able to deal with the physicality of it. Mm. But there will be people who are, you know, if you're dedicated enough to become good at mm. eye racing, I suspect you're dedicated enough to Definitely. to make it in in real motorsport as well. Absolutely. And and obviously you're someone who has made that transition to an extent. You've you've done the sort of yeah. I <laughs> pay for it myself, like, obviously. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean you haven't had a rich daddy to pay it for no, you. Exactly, but you've yeah. still you've got a genetic G40. You've mm-hmm. you, like you alluded to earlier. You've that the car carfection sorry yeah, series. Um, I guess when did you actually because obviously that's a big financial expenditure. When were you like, right, now's the time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen. Um, well, it was, uh, again, it was a case of being in the right place at the right time, um, which is the story of my, my career, <laughs> basically. But um, I'd been you make saving your own up. luck. Okay. Yeah, well, to, to a degree. I, I, do, I do believe that to a degree. Like, you know, you, you, you need to be in the right place at the right time and you need to be, mm. have put yourself in a position where you can take advantage of that. But, but there's, I think anyone who claims that their, their career is entirely based on ah. talent and skill and hard work rather than a bit of good fortune is, of is, is lying. Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> but I, I'd been sort of saving up for a race car for a long time because it's something I knew I always wanted to do. Um, not because I had any like latent talent or anything, but just because I wanted to experience it and, I don't, I don't see why I shouldn't. And that's why I don't feel too bad about kind of pay drivers and, and, and things like that because, like, they're just chasing a dream like any of us. Mm. And, you know, like, if they're not great, that's fine. You know, like, they're, they're, they're enjoying themselves, you know. Yeah, um, so, so I was saving up all the money and then it was just a fortunate um, meeting with Drew, who runs Carfection, at a Project Cars 2 launch event or, or preview event. Um, and they had just lost... Um, Alex Goy, who's a great uh, motorsport journalist and presenter, um, he had just left Carfection um, recently to, to go and, and sort of start something else. And Drew was looking for people to make some content. And he said, you know, have you ever thought about making a video for us? And I said, well, I've always wanted to be a racing driver. How about we do, you know, the average person's guide to becoming a racing driver, basically, uh, with me nice. being the average person. Um, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, sounds good. So we talked to Janetta. Um, we worked out a deal where I could run a, uh, rather than buying a new car to get into the championship, I could run a, a second hand one mm-hmm. um, that they, they would they would sell to me. Um, so I managed to do it a bit more affordably than I would have been able to and a bit sooner than I would have been able to just saving up. Um, and uh, they gave me a discount on the, the championship fees as well because of this video series that we were going to be doing. And, nice, nice. And so I, you know, we put this thing together. I bought the car. I still own the car. It's in uh, a garage at my mum's house at the moment, <laughs> gathering dust because of lockdown. Um, but I, I, you know, it's absolutely my intention to get back out there mm. and race again. Um, but it is very expensive. Uh, but yeah, I was able to, with the money I'd saved, just about scrape it together to do that that um, season in 2018. And we made what I think is is still a really really good documentary and if you know if your viewers and listeners um fancy finding it out it will be linked below for sure thank you yeah yeah I, i'm Definitely. really proud of it i think we made something really really cool it's really what's, good what's cool about it is that like like i said i'm not like a i'm not a karting talent i'm not someone who's like you know uh would have been world champion if i just had the brakes i'm just a guy who loves watching motorsport really loves like um it as a fan and i wanted to know if I could give it a go and the answer is yeah you can and you can have a lot of fun um, and and you know maybe even surprise yourself with with some of the stuff you achieve so yeah it was cool it was really really cool and that's the thing that is the most relatable because most of us are exactly the same we've Mm. you know everyone who is not even just a sim racer just everyone who's interested in racing games or interested in cars or interested in F1 is a you know if, 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 even you ask me now like what did I always want to do as a kid and I'm sure you'd say that like is to be a racing driver yeah that, of course, that was yeah. always the dream and that's the dream of so many of us so you've yeah. actually been able to kind of live it out like how, how was that how was that experience how did that experience differ maybe from what you expected what was the kind of biggest surprise in terms of actually getting out there getting in a race that you weren't kind of anticipating I think the 
the sense of speed and 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 this sort of the kind of information overload that you get like mm. you can play play a racing sim race exactly the same tracks at the same sort of pace um as as you are in the Janetta around say Brands Hatch mm-hmm. like um but when you're in the car it's just there's so much going on the intensity of it and the kind of like physicality of it means that your brain is just absolutely fizzing and it, mm. it can make everything feel like it's coming at you so much faster than when you're just sitting doing exactly the same thing on a on a sim so that's that was a kind of surprise but i will say this and i think this is the um this is another thing that surprised me and it was really cool uh was that um i was you know that thing where you kind of like you really want to do something and then you do it and immediately you're like all right what's the next thing like if you're mm-hmm. quite an ambitious person you're like you achieve something and then yeah, you're like yeah, yeah. right what's the next thing i'm going to achieve next goal, yeah. um but i think because this race driving thing had been such a long term goal and something i just like dreamt about since i was a kid um there was after i finished that that final race at brands hatch and like this is a mild spoiler but i had a really good weekend at brands hatch that final race weekend of the season was was you did. just you did awesome <laughs> um i i had a buzz that lasted for like two weeks afterwards mm. and i was like sort of just like spent the the, the next two weeks just like really on a high which i wasn't expecting at all i was expecting it to be like a huge rush in that final weekend and then like a come down and and just back to like what can i do next but i had a real sense of achievement and satisfaction that i you know haven't experienced maybe ever like from Mm. just having achieved that like dream and done a decent job of it um and so yeah it was it was it was really really cool um and, and yeah that that sort of pinching yourself like i can't believe i yeah, achieved that so. i can imagine man is like it's not just a track day you actually own this car like yeah what's what's that genetic like to drive like is it fun how yeah you imagine? challenging like, do you like but, it yeah yeah it's it's um it's very lightweight obviously um and it it's not it's not got a ton of horsepower it's 135 horsepower i think but um it only weighs like 950 kilos so it's it's fast and it's agile but it's also challenging to drive because it's got no traction control, no ABS, no stability control. It's mm. all down to the driver and it's all down to your ability. So it's easy to get it wrong. And I, I have crashed it, as you'll see if you watch the series. Um, but I yeah, was going to ask about that. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's challenging. I think it will teach you. It's a great learner's tool because it will mm-hmm. teach you good habits in the car, like you know, making sure you're braking in a straight line as much as possible or, or at least under control um and you know uh just yeah it's it's good to learn because it is tougher i think than say a a gt3 car which you know i think a gentleman driver can jump into and and be pretty quick pretty quickly Mm -hmm. because they've got tc and stability control and and abs to to help them out so yeah it's 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 challenging but fun and and very involved very sort of physical you feel everything coming through the car and it feels like a baby gt car as well which is great on the racetrack on the road i actually drove my car to all of the races on i the was road. gonna it's say ro- it's road legal and it's yeah for a two and a half hour three hour motorway journey it's noisy <laughs> and <laughs> uncomfortable yeah exactly yeah yeah um so yeah and i, I drove it in the wet to a, a race and at one point i was just like plunging into these puddles oh and just God, really no. worried about aquaplaning off and stuff so <laughs> that yeah, would be about you've not even made yeah. it to the track and you've it's binned it on the m stuff, yeah, <laughs> stuffed it yeah so well anyway uh, it survived uh, uh, yeah, well, it, it survived, but obviously there was that first little ding. Mm, um, yeah. What was, I guess, beyond le- like, what was it like to have the crash? Like, mm. rough little car. Like, it could take the hit. Like, it looked to oh, be yeah. mainly cosmetic, wasn't it, the damage? But it like, was, ha- yeah, it was entirely cosmetic, yeah. How did you come away from... Because it was always going to happen at some point, wasn't it, mm. really? Like, everyone, uh, every racing driver crashes, and you're yeah. now a racing driver. So how was... Technically, do, yeah. <laughs> do you think it was good? Yeah, technically. Do you think do you think it was good that you kind of got that away out of your system quite early? Maybe. Yeah, it didn't know. feel like it at the time. It felt awful, you know. Yeah, of but, course, um, of course. But in retrospect, like better yeah. to have done that um, on a you know on a track day pre-season when the car could be fixed and, and mm-hmm. ready for the season. And I think it taught me it taught me a sort of valuable lesson about respecting the car and and mm-hmm. and you know actually I think I was treating it a bit casually to be honest mm-hmm. and i you know at the time um the most foolish thing was i wasn't I, you know i was recording a piece of camera i wasn't wearing a helmet and i should have really been wearing a helmet basically. yeah i did notice that i was I like said, yeah why is he not wearing a helmet that's yeah it was it was silly <laughs> and it, it, in retrospect that's that you know that's a really dumb thing to do and i do not recommend it um learn from but you wouldn't have necessarily learned that lesson if you hadn't have done that then that's the thing isn't it yeah this is it so the the 
the crash itself was um i i didn't sort of um i didn't break early enough for corner and then mm. i i sort of stepped on the brakes a little too hard over a crest and so the rear end got light and it rotated so um just just from that learning to to be a bit more you know careful with the car gentle with my inputs not as abrupt and and to be looking ahead and, and concentrating basically on the on the mm. corners ahead um so yeah it was it, it was a, a key learning experience and it was expensive you know like repairs were expensive um several thousand pounds uh so even though it was only cosmetic it's like <laughs> it was every panel along the one side yeah. of the car the rear wing was rear taken wing off was gone. Yeah. yeah lights were smashed i've still got a rear wing end plate actually on nice. the shelf just as a reminder not nice. to be a jerk um, <laughs> just always there watching yeah. you um but what was funny was drew was there obviously we were filming for car faction that day and yeah. um the first thing he asked me was are you okay the second thing he asked me was Can, are you okay if we use that in the thing i'm like yeah it's fine you've got it you've got it you can't not Tight use old it. thumb yeah. now it's yeah done. exactly yeah yeah <laughs> um and i was like it's all it's all content isn't it but um of course but, um yeah it was a painful experience to go through but i'm glad i got it out of the way and i'm glad i just didn't miss any of the races you know like i mm. I, I would have would have been gutted to have spent that much money to go racing and not you know not made the start of one of the races that would have been worse you know if sure. i'd stuffed it in practice and they couldn't fix it before you know the race so and then I guess having gone through that experience of, you know, getting a Janetta and, and working alongside, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the other drivers, are they all similar backgrounds to you where they've always older, had ambitions? Generally, to do older, older okay. and more successful. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of, uh, I, there, there were, there was at least one guy, um, Chris Solkeld, who mm. is a very talented driver and will be, as far as I know, um, well, I would hope he'll be in British GT like this year or next year. Nice. Um, so he he was great, and he's a young, very successful guy. Um, so he was younger, but a lot of the guys were a bit older than me, and and mainly just like successful business owners, basically guys okay. who yeah you know ha- have have done well for themselves and disposable have a bit of income, money. and yeah, and have chosen to spend their their money this way. You know, I I could have I could have bought a you know a road going Porsche for the amount of money I you know, not mm. a new one, but a you know like a a, a second hand road going Porsche for the money yeah, I spent yeah. on a on a race car, but my priority was going racing basically. And that was always going to, where I was going to spend my money. And these guys are the same, you know? Like. Yeah, of course. Cause I was going to say if, if like having had that experience, like would you recommend that route? Are there like, if, if some, if some, if there's someone watching who's kind of, you know, they've got a bit of disposable income, they want to get involved into motorsport. Knowing, having your experience, like what route would you recommend? Are there other series that you think are maybe a bit cheaper, a bit easier to enter? Or, or um, I don't know. I don't think the I don't think Janetta run the series that I I ran anymore. Okay. I think they've got a more expensive product with a, a sort of faster GT car, basically, which is great. Fair I'm enough. sure if you've got the money. Um, but I know it. that the Caterham Academy still exists. Like that's a okay. that's a very similar sort of thing where you buy the car you get some tuition you get some you know various different events and stuff and i i know the cage academy is really great i do i do love what janetta do um which is like really try and create a motorsport ladder where you can start you know early in a in a low powered car and then you can work your way up to a, a sort of gt4 spec and then maybe a gt3 spec and then a you know lmp3 and you know you've got a kind of like route and a progression and they do a great job um I think the the camaraderie was was incredible. You know, mm. I, I think that's the thing. Yeah, it must have been nice. These these things with um, you know, you could go and race MX fives, right? You could probably yeah. put together a racing MX five pretty cheap, but the problem is you'd be dumped into a series with a bunch of like absolute lifers. You know, guys who've been like racing MX fives for the last twenty years, and they're going to hand your ass to you on the front, <laughs> basically. Whereas if you go for something like Caterham Academy or you know GRDC as it was. Mm. The rules are you can't have had a race license beforehand. So it's all okay. guys who, you know, there might be guys who are fast and who have been doing track days for years. Great. That, that's fair enough. But at least, you know, they've never been in a race before. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that was the benefit for me is that when we all rocked up, we were all excited to be living out this dream and we were all novices, you know, we, we were all had never, never yeah. done a race before. So, that was really cool, and, and the first thing we did was set up a WhatsApp group together. A WhatsApp group nice. we still have going, and oh, it was all that. friendly rivalries and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's cool. We play racing sims together and things like that, and it's just um, 
yeah, good good mates for life, basically, from from that shared experience of everyone like living out their dream. So absolutely recommend it. But yeah, I'm not sure Janetta do the exact thing I was doing, but um, I know Caterham do a, a similar mm. sort of similar deal. It's that's amazing, man. And, and that is that is the kind of thing that is is such a shame because motorsport is so expensive and so difficult to get. Like, yeah, what do you think? It's difficult. What what could what could we be doing more? Not even just as a community, what could the powers that be do more to to make sport a more inclusive in terms of like you know the finances because that's the biggest thing that that's such a uh, that stops people even considering getting involved what could what could be done to make it a more you know approachable and 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 all, all inclusive sport to everyone because it's yeah it's, it, it's a pipe dream for far too many that we can't even even imagine indulging in yeah I think I mean one thing I would say is that if you are really like short of cash, like gaming is, is really good. And sim sims are really, really good. I like, mm. I know it's not necessarily like uh, people, people don't consider it necessarily like a, a replacement, but I, I will say this, like having gone racing, I expected to never want to touch a racing sim again. I expected mm. to be like, well, this is garbage, but actually what real racing did for me was gave me a real appreciation of how, close the sims get to that feeling mm-hmm. and particularly something like i racing where every race feels meaningful and it's a proper competition mm-hmm. you've got safety rating to consider so you're trying to avoid crashes and things like that you know it, it's it's amazing how close it can get to that feeling of motorsport um the other thing i would say is there's been a really i think one of the things that has been like a sort of self-correcting thing is the emergence of like the citroen c1 cup and the mm-hmm. enduro car series which are both uh, racing series based around like mass production like hatchbacks but racing modified so yep. Citroen C1 is not an attractive car it's a little <laughs> like city runabout type thing but there is an entire race series that does like 24 hour races and all sorts of like cool stuff that is mm. based entirely around people race modifying these for a few thousand pounds and then going racing for as cheap as you can go car racing yeah, in this yeah. country um, so there are there are options out there like that are sort of cheap uh, and then the other thing I would say is like, if you can't go car racing, go kart racing, like club 100, you know, uh, yeah. amazing, like again, community around, around that. So um, I do think, you know, the, the route to formula one is obviously extremely expensive, but of there course, are, of course. there are ways to go racing if you are motivated enough. Um, yeah, and there, yeah. are, there are cheaper ways to go racing than I did it. You know, mm. I, I, the GRDC thing was, slightly more expensive but i part of me wanted that kind of rear wheel drive gt yeah experience i wanted the hand holding and the guidance through the through the process of getting a competition license and and going through my first race that was useful but you can do that research yourself and and you know it, i think the first step if you if you've pondered um racing is to join some facebook groups so the citroen c1 mm-hmm. racing uh facebook group the enduro car racing facebook group and um there's like a club a uk club racing facebook group get in there just start having conversations with people and you'll realize that cars come up for sale that you know that you might be interested in uh teams might be looking for drivers and you might be able to make friends with some people and 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 go and do a test and you know if you're as quick as you think you are you might you might get a (laughs) a shot at being part of a an endurance team and i think you know what i the the thing that stayed with me uh watching the first c1 citroen c1 24-hour race at silverstone that i watched was that um there was a race team in that race which was called something along the lines of dave stag do now <laughs> if dave and his mates can put together a racing team for dave stag do and do oh a 24-hour endurance race then maybe you can too. That's, That's my inspirational idea. message to to want to be racing drivers. You right might now. have just actually decided because I don't know what I'm going to do for my stag, but maybe All that's right. it. Yeah, maybe that is it. Because no, that's the thing. Like I'm literally like once once I've got space where I can have more than one car because we've just got one car at the minute and it's mm-hmm. in the once I once I bought a place, I just want to get I don't care what it is the shittiest little car possible mm-hmm. and just take it racing. Like I'd rather have a cheaper, smaller car because then I'm a bit less worried yes. about if I do crash it. Then oh, it's only a few hundred quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, but, but, that's a key factor. Like mm. my when I was doing the Janetta stuff, like I said, I scraped together enough money for this um, this race car. But mm. I was like one big accident away from not finishing that season. You know, because if I if I had a big 
a big wreck and it was multiple thousands again yeah, yeah. after the one I'd had in testing. You know, I wasn't going to be able to afford that. So I was really right on the edge of what was possible. Mm. Um, which again, you know, it's, that's a, a, a you know realistic concern for a lot of people. For sure, um, absolutely. If you smash a Ford car into a wall, like the parts are, are dirt cheap, you know, yeah, as long exactly. as you're okay. Yeah, um, that's the main thing. As long as the roll cage is all right, yeah. you're so, fine. But... Yeah, let's do it. I'll, I'm up for that. I look forward definitely, to the invite mate. for your endurance. Definitely, team. definitely, <laughs> mate. No, like, literally, that's one of my, one of my like, um, what's the what's the when you got a list bucket list a bucket list that's the one yeah. that's, that's, that's up there on my bouquet list, list right <laughs> <laughs> my Chanel list did they yeah. right so any, but anyway what, one thing we haven't really touched on Mike yes. is that it's F1 we haven't yes. really talked about let's F1 talk about it yeah of it. That's, um, I just presumably kind of that's what the people are here for really but. presumably <laughs> no they're here for you Mike. come on <laughs> the crowd goes wild um, so what is your I guess what's your kind of Basically, what's your thoughts on the state of F1 at the moment? You know, what's your? Do you have a particular driver, a particular team, etc., um, etc.? You know, I've never, I've never really been much of a, a sort of like fan of specific drivers. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like Lewis. I think he's great. Um, I, I most of the time don't want him to win because it's a bit boring. But I think of he course. is. A, ph- a phenomenal talent. I've been lucky enough to meet him actually um, nice. years ago, uh, before he even got into F1, which was a bonkers experience. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'll tell that story now. So yeah, that, that Bridgestone E reporter thing I was talking about when I was a, okay. uh, uh, in uni, the following year I went to Silverstone and I was still kind of in touch with the the people who ran it and, and stuff like that. And um, I I was chatting to them and uh, and they were running the post Grand Prix party. So you know the big thing they do on a stage at Silverstone afterwards. They get the drivers mm-hmm. up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the the uh, friend of mine, Debbie, who's a PR for the, them, was like, "Do you want to do you want to come backstage for that?" I was like, "Yes, absolutely." Um, so uh, no, no, thank yeah. you. I don't want to go backstage at F one. <laughs> so this is it. I wasn't even it wasn't even part of the competition <laughs> stuff, but it was just like she was yeah. just like, "Here you go, backstage." And um, I caught up with Lewis Hamilton after he'd just come off stage in front of like those crowds of people, mm. and it was a brilliant, brilliant moment because he came off the stage and was like there are so many people out there and I was able to be the one to say to him, they were all around the circuit while you were racing and they know exactly who you are because it was that era, it was 2006 when um, he was in GP2 and I don't know mm-hmm. if you remember that race but he overtook like Nelson Piquet Jr. and another driver. They went three wide through Maggots and Beckett yep. and yeah, he yeah, kept yeah. his foot in and overtook them both and the crowd around Silverstone just like roared. I've never heard nothing like it in the actual Grand Prix mm. um, not least because I think Jensen Button had a shocker that, that weekend. <laughs> but um, the crowd went up. And so I was able to say to, to Lewis, yeah, they all know who, exactly who you are. Like, and, and we had a really nice chat. And he's a, he was just really lovely and super yeah. humble. And that's, I think, you know, throughout Lewis's career, I think he's gotten a, a load of flack in the, in the press and things like that, which I think is unfair because fundamentally he's like a, he is a good guy. Um, he's had his moments where he said kind of like silly things or seemed petulant. But I think that's just a... a, a uh, sort of side effect of being like in the spotlight and growing up in the limelight pressure. exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think we all would have had you know he was a you know 21 year old or whatever you know when he got into Formula 1 um, and I think you know I was a bit of a knobhead when I was 21 yeah um, same I, I think we we're all we we're all allowed our knobhead moments but like fundamentally Precisely. he is a good guy and I think you know people give him all sorts of nonsense but he's he he's fundamentally a sound guy and is just I think probably probably the best of all time like i know there's a lot of debate and we could get into that and we could have a whole other podcast on that subject (laughs) my personal opinion is i think he's probably the best of all time um so he's great but i don't like i don't go into a race hoping he'll win i go Mm. into a race hoping for good racing basically that's what i'm interested in um and i i you know i love to um i love to see that that action and we've had a wacky season so it's really difficult it's really difficult to talk about like the current state of formula one because like i don't know whether this season is going to be back to a sort of slightly more slightly less dramatic slightly more sort of standard season because 2020 was was i think all sport not just f1 as well like yeah football's been premier league season's been mad yeah Yeah, exactly like it's uh, there's something in the water at the minute i don't know yeah (laughs) well there's something in in our lungs (laughs) yeah um (laughs) but yeah so yeah, I think you know Formula One's got some big questions to answer. I think uh, the biggest threat to Formula One at the moment is the manufacturer exodus, which is gonna happen at some point. Mm. Like, it's not 
currently a good look for a, a, a manufacturer to be like making combustion engines basically and that's that's the position we're in at the moment so like how does f1 navigate that and do they do they go well right instead of like courting big manufacturer teams do we m- make an ecosystem where like privateer teams like williams could could potentially mm. be you know the face of formula one and the big teams and stuff um uh so that's that's a big sort of existential question i don't have the answer Definitely. to it i'd probably be paid quite a lot more if i did have the answer <laughs> to it. But, but i think anyone who thinks that mercedes are going to stick around for for another decade it seems unlikely to me not unless formula one you know switches to hydrogen or something like that so that's kind of interesting mm. thing and i'm not like worried per se like i love combustion engines i love you know i love them and i i do hope that they kind of stick around as a as a as an option for you know like limited use like track days and racing yeah. things. but but i think formula one has a kind of global showcase and a marketing exercise in a lot of cases for manufacturers yeah. like formula one needs to work out how it appears somewhat green and appears to not be like antisocial. um i think from a a fan perspective one of the things that frustrates me a lot uh recently is uh just like gatekeeping around the sport um i'll probably get a few people angry uh by saying this but like you know i don't i don't care how many like teenage girls like formula one brilliant as far as i'm concerned drive to survive fans yes yeah. right drive yeah, to i survive. couldn't agree more mate couldn't right agree more what if you love this sport it needs fans and it, you know you should be bringing it's fans such a from naive wherever yeah viewpoint, so isn't it? this is it like so you know the idea of like not proper formula one fans or dts fans or whatever mm. um however they get to your sport however they support it if they're they're watching races buying t-shirts you know particularly in an era where f1 isn't even on like non-paid tv no anymore, exactly right? so like if you want your sport to survive you should be welcoming absolutely everyone and you know i think if i don't care if you came to formula one because charles leclerc is a handsome man uh, it, I mean, he is. Fine. You know, yeah, he just, is. Yeah, just that true. just means you have functioning <laughs> eyeballs. Um, but the, the, if you stick around and you're having fun and you're enjoying it, welcome. You know, like I'm, I'm here as the official voice of the Formula One fandom. I Couldn't say welcome, more, welcome to. So that's a thing that frustrates me. But Drive to Survive is amazing. Like, what a way to get oh, people, like people who incredible. just had no idea. And they, what people are learning via Drive to Survive is what actual real formula one fans have known all along which is that it's about the human stories like obviously racing the racing's brilliant you want to see the action on the the track but what makes it what you know gives it that real edge is is the fact that they're people and you know there are emotions and there are rivalries and anger you know like it you know without the people racing is nothing um so uh that's all it is is drive to survive just focuses on those stories going in and going out of races so um, so yeah, I think Drive to Survive is brilliant. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next season because the 2021 is going to be like so intense. But I was in, I was in bits at the end of the last season of Drive. I mean, when, do, when yeah, Gasly any... gets his podium, like oh. what the, like how can you not be like sort of fully invested in that? So, Edge of see, well, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm an Alex Albon fan. So oh, amazing. Last yeah. season was difficult. <laughs> mm. um, many, I, I took many an hour on this channel. Um, over the last season but yeah, do, does, does, does any particular race kind of stick in your mind or uh i, I so many. There, there were so many last season that were that were brilliant i mean monza was was bonkers and it was yeah. really it was a really nice validation for gasly having been like so sc- good, yeah. screwed over by the like you the say Red it's the redemption arc it's that story to yeah. it that just makes it all the more like it's it's amazing a midfield driver winning anyway but especially yeah. him yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it doesn't, you know, if they were all called driver A, driver B and driver yeah. C, like, you know, you just, you wouldn't you care, care as much. No. Um, but it, yeah, everyone's got a backstory, everyone's got a motivation, everyone's got a rivalry. And um, and that's why that's why I tune in, you know, like, um, I, I love the on-track action. The technical side fascinates me, obviously, but um, but I don't mind if, if any of those elements, like, leaves you cold. If you're, mm. if you're a fan of Formula One and you're prepared to sit through the boring races, you're you're fine by me, you know. Do you have? Do you think the new regulations will sort sort that out? Sort that problem out? The boring. I don't know. We've had a lot of. We've known what the problems are with Formula One and overtaking for a long time, um, and I I don't know if they've solved them yet. Maybe maybe it will fix it, but it's um, surely it, if if it shakes surely. up the order and it gives an, another Please. opportunity for someone to to come to the front, then for sure, then that's great. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you something like. Um, we've you know we've been become conditioned to 
to be excited by like DRS overtakes, right? Like, you, remember, <laughs> you know, like back when they introduced so DRS, true. like it yeah, just yeah. felt so pony when someone pressed a button and drove mm-hmm. fast. But now those are the overtakes we get are DRS overtakes. So like, if they could bring back like old school overtaking, where you know the car, it's possible to duck in behind someone, you know, pull up behind them in the slipstream and then and then send it down the inside, mm. that'd be great. But I don't know well, if that'll happen. That's what kind of because it annoys me because I know I think we're all guilty of it of like criticizing the tracks where actually the criticism should be laid firmly at the the rule makers where yeah. they were 100%. chasing quickest lap time possible mm. f- and and not not uh, it was it's mad to me how they just completely like overlooked the fact that focusing on aero downforce was gonna create all this dirty air which then ruins tracks like Catalonia yeah. which I think is a great track like you don't you don't see any problems in any other racing series apart yeah. from F1 GT GT races there it's they yeah. they have great races there same with Paul Ricard like I love mm-hmm. the GT races around Paul Ricard they're always amazing even though it's a boring featureless like flat plane it's actually as a track like pretty technical mm. pretty fun it's got some bonkers corners in it so yeah I mean Catalonia is such a, a snooze like it's like my yearly nap, basically, like guaranteed. Um, <laughs> well, it's it, got medium speed corners, plus it's the testing venue. So it's just like double. Yes. So double they all hell. know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's awful. Um, so yeah, hopefully, I mean, fingers crossed. I, I honestly don't know. But um, it, it, it's it's a rule shake up is always good because. For sure. Know, definitely. It, it gives you a bit of hope. But I always, I'm always like such a sucker for the like preseason hype. I don't know about you. Yeah, like, yeah. But I'm like looking at testing times, going, "Ooh, maybe this year, maybe this year." I know, like someone I know. Will, someone will you can't sort not, out can you? You can't yeah. not. And then you get to the first race, you're like, "Ah, oh. oh, it's just Mercedes, Mercedes like, again." Well, I was going to say, so do you have any particular? Because well, look, we've got Vettel going to Aston Martin, yep. so potentially in a car that's going to suit him a lot better. Alonso mm. coming in. Like, do you have any big bold predictions? Do you ha- like how do you think them two particularly are going to do? Because I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on um, yeah and Sebastian. I lo- I I don't even know about the um I mean maybe you know maybe the car is the key factor but I think also just like culturally I think Vettel needs a change like and I I don't think he's forgotten how to drive you know I was there when I was I was at Monza for Vettel's first win which was oh, wow. like bonkers you know in the, in yeah, the uh, Toro right. Rosso yeah, 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 uh, yeah in in 2008 so like that was uh you know he's a he's a phenomenally talented driver I don't think he's forgotten how to drive I think Leclerc is is a brilliant talent as well. And maybe, maybe Leclerc is, is just generally faster than uh, Vettel. But I do think young drivers have a kind of adaptability and like Vettel had mm. that adaptability back in the days of the blown diffuser. Like he was the guy who absolutely nailed how to use that thing, getting on the throttle, like mid corner to keep the, keep the exhaust yep. uh, flowing underneath that blown diffuser. Like he was the one who was able to adapt his driving style quickest to that thing so i think he's maybe lost a bit of that adaptability you know he's a little more set in his ways but i think with a car if if the car suits him i think culturally just having a team that like respects him a bit more do you know what i mean i think yeah, ferrari yeah, yeah. ferrari like to like to play the mind games and i think yeah like uh you know briatori was the same at renault back at, back in his day like he liked to sort of you know be saying pointed things in the press to like you know and it just that kind of needle i don't think mm. I don't think Vettel responds to that. Some well. respond well to that, some don't. Yeah, you know, exactly. Fernando won his two world titles under Briatore, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, but they had such a close relationship. You yeah, know? yeah. So it was like a, it was a sort of special, you know, to the point where Briatore told PK Junior to crash his car. Yeah, <laughs> and he was like, okay, you know, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, it's 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 weird, isn't it? Again, it comes down to those sort of personal relationships. But I'd really like to see Vettel have a, mm. like, he's not going to win another world championship, I don't think. But we shouldn't forget that he has won four of them. And regardless of how good the car was, you don't yeah. win four world championships by being an absolute mug. No. So. You don't, uh, I, I don't want him to be remembered for the Spignalas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It would, be, it would be a sad way for his kind of very illustrious career to end. What, what, so what do you think of Alonso, though? Did you think he's going to... What level do you think he's at? I think... Coming back. Alonso... I... The thing about Alonso is he's he's brilliant. Obviously, he's brilliant. He's just such a fantastically talented, incredible player. talent but, in his prime. And I know this sure. doesn't, this isn't, this isn't actually an indicator of anything. But <laughs> he's always made terrible decisions in his career. Like every move he's made has been like the wrong decision. It's true. Um, it's so, so true. Even if this, even if like, even if you know Alpine is they're going to be a like resurgent mm. and stuff, I just can't shake that feeling that it's going to be a disaster because it's like every <laughs> career move that Alonso does within Formula One is just is bad. 
Mm. Um, I, feel, yeah. I feel like if, if it's if it's going good, he'll be good. If it's going bad, will we see more GP2 engine comments? I don't know. Probably, yeah. Maybe. But I think he's earned the right. You know, he's earned the right to like criticize the the car and the team. Like, I think if you've got Alonso in the team, you've got to you've got to try and keep him happy. He's probably pretty demanding, sure. but like. It's weird. I it, I can tell he rubs people up the wrong way sometimes mm. within the team. But like, I'm not his biggest fan. I'll be honest. I'm not. Um. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. A, not a massive Alonso fan, I suppose. But um. I get I, why I'm people. Aware of his you, it's kind of marmite, isn't it? You're gonna you're gonna respond well to that, or you, I just think he comes across as a bit obnoxious and up his own ass sometimes. Yeah. To be he's, honest, he's mellowed a lot. I've met him twice. I met mm. him once in 2005 at Monza, uh, and he was quite dismissive like fair play you know I was bothering him as a fan <laughs> but he was pretty dismissive but then I met him more recently uh, and he was a bit more chill a bit more mm. relaxed I've got a buddy who's a just a my buddy Martin's just a, the world's biggest Alonso fan and he actually like fair play to him he recorded like a message to Martin oh, that's nice. uh, which was just like really lovely thing to do and you know clearly he didn't probably didn't want to do that he could he was, sense uh, the real fan you know yeah well, clearly yeah that energy, gave him the yeah. attention <laughs> yeah. um all right nice. but like i want i'd want to see him do well i, I think it'd be yeah it's, it's for a, sure. again it's all about the stories it's all about the, the soap mm. opera and yeah another redemption art would be super hollywood you know if like alonso wins another race ah you know next season that'd be amazing i, I don't think uh, even even I, i'd love to see it i'd love to see mm. it. imagine he, alonso winning another race would i'd yeah I, i'm all for that for sure yeah um okay mike well we've got a few more questions okay sure. don't take too much too much more of your time so thank Sorry. you for honestly i really do appreciate That's okay. you giving up your evening on your holiday as well um just a few quick fire questions now sure. these aren't necessarily f1 related at all okay first question favorite flavor crisps uh, I like Doritos, and for my sins, I like the cheese ones, the tangy Ooh, cheese ones. Yeah. Good lads, yes, the ones that make your fingers orange. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm sure they're the most antisocial thing to be eating on public transport. <laughs> but none of us are on public transport anymore. So. Exactly. It's, yeah, not, not just like yeah. licking your fingers in the middle of a tube train. No, yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, we're in lockdown. So, dream yeah. holiday destination. Where have you been craving to go? Oh man, uh, I can make it F1 related. I do. If you want to want. Go, I, I would love to. I would um, love to have seen a Singapore Grand Prix, but that, Ooh, that city yes. just looks incredible, you know. Um, uh, I've I been guess, to Singapore a couple of times. Beautiful place. Yeah, it really looks good. astonishing. But yeah, um, yeah. I guess my 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 absolute dream is to go and see Monaco, even though it's usually nice. a tedious race. Um, it's uh, I, I I just need to see that race before yeah. I before I kick the bucket. Yeah, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. That's that. If I had to pick any race to go to, I was chatting with my missus earlier. It'd be. Yeah. Spa or Monaco? I, yeah, I've been to Spa, but not for the Formula One. I went for the uh, Spa Twenty Four Hours. And, oh, like, nice! It's a wicked Amazing. circuit. So oh. so cool. Did you have to uh, stay up all night? Yeah, I was. I was. I, well, I had about two hours sleep in the stands with the sound nice. of GT engines reverberating. <laughs> it's incredible. Oh, um, that sounds very therapeutic. <laughs> it was well. My my buddy Martin was there, and he didn't sleep a wink. But I I had a great I had a great couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Monaco Monaco would be amazing. Like that that day because I love mm. the Indy Five Hundred as well. That day is like mm -hmm. motorsport Christmas for me. It's basically yeah. watch Monaco, watch the Indy Five Hundred, bliss, absolutely done, bliss. done. Just every world go away. Just let me watch mm. this on telly. Um, yep. All right then. Next question. Yes. Favorite sport outside of Formula One? Oh, uh, what I like. I wa I watch like football internationals. I don't really follow the Premier League so much. Um, I watch. Do you have a team that you? Yeah, it's Leeds actually. Okay. Um, nice. Just because I grew up near there, so um, yeah, they're back in the Premiership. They're doing mm -hmm. okay considering. Um, yeah, no, not bad. Not bad. They'll, um, they'll be safe this year. Yeah, yeah, this is it. So, so that's cool. Good for them. Um, I watch a bit of rugby as well. I, I'm nice. my mum's Irish, and okay, my mum's side is the rugby fan mm -hmm. side of the family. So, uh, I watch the Six Nations as well. But yeah, it's mainly motorsport. Like I watch, uh, you would not believe the amount of motorsport I watch. I watch GT racing, sports car racing. I'll watch like Indy car. I'll watch rally. Oh, you know, like so. Any spare moment is usually yeah. yeah. By. Like I think some rally, sort of cars. rally's my other like I, I don't know I, I haven't really given much but I love rally there's just something about the way them drivers like fly through corners that it's just yeah. did you watch the Monte Carlo stuff 
I did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, astonishing scenery, amazing drivers, like super tough conditions. It's really, really cool. It's all, the coverage on Red Bull TV is amazing. Mm. Like it's yeah, really, oh. really good. So. Red Bull Media House is, is mm. crazy. They, they do amazing stuff. Uh, next question, savory or sweet? Savory. Yeah. What's your like, uh, good man, I agree, couldn't, couldn't agree more. So yeah. you're like starter and main rather than main dessert. Yep. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I like, I, you know, cheese and things, cheesy things. <laughs> Hence the Doritos, cheesy. Yeah, cheese, actual cheese, real cheese, all sorts yeah. of stuff. Um, mac and cheese, the ultimate comfort. Mac, food, oh, you know? so. beautiful. I make a mean mac and cheese. That's pretty much the only thing I can do. <laughs> but it's really good. They do some good, um, actually, I'm kind of veggie, but not. So they do they, they do some good, uh, but good they do good mass. vegan, <laughs> vegan mac and cheese as well. Do sometimes. they? I yeah, feel yeah. like, I feel it's like that's right. just too high. That's just too high a bar to match. Like, <laughs> I have very it's nothing high on the real thing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but it's still yeah, good. Exactly. If you just enjoy it for what it is. It's like, well, my, it's like if you go in expecting, yeah, your expectation, it's, it's like if you have vegan chicken and expect it to taste like real chicken, you're going to be yeah. disappointed. But the actual flavor on its own is all right. Yeah, I um, I've switched almost entirely to like uh, vegetarian, like pretend meat burgers, like because mm. they're so good these days. Like you can get these, like uh, you can get these, be- uh, like I don't know, like, Beyond Meat burgers or whatever they're called. There's and, one like, called there's... Naked Glory. Right. Oh my god! If you haven't tried it, please yeah. do. It's so good. And so you know, good. like a bur- a good burger is uh, as much about the toppings as it is about the meat. Abs- but like, absolutely. I I'm now at the point where I'm like, I could quite happily just eat, you know. Uh, a, a veggie burger that is is you know well made and and mm. full of good toppings. I've been to Lewis Hamilton's uh, vegan Have burger you? restaurant. Yeah, it was good. It's fast Isn't foody, it? but it's really nice. Yeah, it's just off Regent Street. Um, oh, yeah, I'd love to go there. That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Before well, lockdown, we're be obviously. For a while. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> just there um, knocking at the door trying to get in. But it, it's it's a lot easier to replicate stuff like mince meat because it is processed mm. anyway, rather than like a, you're never going to get a, a good vegan steak. I don't think this is it. Yeah. But that's like I I'm not like I am a, a carnivore, but I'm not interested in killing animals. So mm. if they can recreate all the things I love to eat, um, yeah, then yeah. without killing animals, <laughs> then I will absolutely transition. It's just I I've always been like I've always been more more into the kind of flavors of meat and things mm. than the flavors of vegetables. So fair enough. Do you, actually talking of animals, do you have any pets? Or... No, no pets. No, I'm allergic to cats. I really like cats, but oh. I'm allergic to them. So. So it would be a cat if you were to, but you are allergic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that sucks, man. That's a shame. I should get Cats tortoise or something. They don't. They yeah. Don't shed for. Yeah. That's true, and they don't run off either. They can just. Yeah. Know, they just chill. <laughs> You're yeah. going to be able to catch it if it ever runs away. <laughs> exactly. All right. Next question. Mm-hmm. Dream, and I'm going to say so. This is. I want a realistic one, and then a proper dream one. So okay. dream road car. All right. Realistic one. If you if you had to live with it today, it's, it's on it's on your driveway right now. You've got to pay for yeah. its insurance and all that stuff that comes. With um, it. I think the one that would like uh, that would do it for me at the moment is a BMW i8, which is the kind of nice. It's like a, it's like a sports car, like hybrid sports car. Yeah. Um, they're depreciating in value massively. Oh like, wow! Okay. Like any BMW, basically. Yeah. So they're down to about like thirty k at the moment. I'm like, okay. once they get down to about like twenty k, maybe I could get a bit, you know, borrow a bit of money and like, <laughs> um, maybe grab one of those. That. Um, ultimate dream car is probably a Ferrari Testarossa, just because it's like, Ooh. I just love all that eighties vibe, um, and it's just a beautiful car. So, yeah. Iconic, iconic, absolutely. Yeah, those side strikes, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Beautiful car, beautiful car. I, I'm, I'm. How about for you? Me, for me, the, uh, the Ferrari 360. Yeah, yeah. Fair. If I'm thinking of Ferraris of that, there's just something about the 360. I just think that's such a beautiful car. It's a lovely looking car. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just voluptuous. I love it. But what's your attainable one? What's your attainable like, one? I could afford this. Uh, 996 ooh. Porsches are like getting quite affordable as well. You know like, what? You know what I really like at the moment is the new V8 Vantage. Mm. the Aston I love yeah, the yeah. way that car looks it looks beautiful it's a beautiful looking so, car so, like they just consistently deliver like I look back at the old V8 Vantage which I remember at the time I was like oh that looks really nice but this is just it's just mean there's something as well I really like about um, I've always I, I'm kind of into my Japanese cars mm-hmm. I, like, I love a bit of JDM yep so I, I there's something about getting like a a, a, a Lexus IS like 300 oh, really? big that's drift like a, wheels that's a, on it. That's a Need for Speed classic, the IS. Yeah, like, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. That, there's some, yeah, that Lexus, I think it's a IS 2, I can't even, IS 200? I think it's IS 300. In, is it an Underground 2? 
<laughs> yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, that car. One of the starter just, cars. Yeah. Oh, love that motor. That, I would just stick with that car for the whole thing. That that's my favourite car in those games. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. And what about favourite F1 car of all time? Do you have one particular? Uh, probably the '91 McLaren in the Marlboro mm-hmm. livery. Like, I just love the way that car looks. Um, I love all those old Iconic. like early 90s like mm. Ferrari Williams uh, McLaren stuff I've just got such fond memories like as a kid so, of that stuff like just the shape of those cars as well like yeah. the, they're just aesthetically so that's, simple, my, that's yeah. my favourite generation in terms yeah. of the aesthetic of the cars for sure they get really they get really fussy after that whereas yeah, yeah. at that point it's just like big front wing big rear wing fat tyres clean oh, bodywork lovely pure pure driving mm. and what about um, last season 2020 what was yes. your favourite like livery which car which car did you like the most uh, I thought the Mercedes looked amazing in black. Um, I quite like the I quite like the Alpha Tori actually. Like weirdly, uh, you're one of them. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I hate just, it. <laughs> really, I just something about that like white and like darkish blue. But yeah. my favorite, my my problem is, is it replaced one of my favorite liveries. Thank which you. Is the, yes. The red, uh, the red and Toro blue Rosso. and silver Toro Rosso livery, which Beautiful. I just think is such a good livery. Um, and I'm sad that doesn't I exist anymore. I couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. But I, I, what are you thinking? Because obviously next year we've got Aston with a new one. We've got Alpine with, mm. with a new one. <clears throat> Mercedes, we don't know if they're going to stick to black or go back to silver. Yeah. What, um, what are you thinking? I, I'm looking forward to the Alpine. I think it'll be blue. You know, um, I like a bl- I like a blue F1 car. Too many F1 cars are sort of white and silver and things. Mm. We had a, a real era, sort of mid 2010s, where it was just like every car seemed to be grey. Mm. Um, so I'm glad we've moved beyond that a bit. But um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the Alpine livery. Hopefully it'll be kind of blue and kind of a throwback to the old sort of rally cars and things. So yeah, fingers crossed. And I, oh, hope the, I hope Aston don't go for like ra- British Racing Green. I hope they go for that like acid yellow that they have in GT Racing, which just looks So bonkers. it looks like, and actually Aston posted, if you go on their Twitter, they posted a close-up of what looks like the, the cuffs, like the ankle cuffs of someone's overalls. Oh yeah. And they do look... British Racing Green with Fair. white, um, oh, okay. but also all of their promotional material has had it's the mainly the green. But just I, I feel like we're going to get a mainly dark green car with little hits of the lime. I think like the proportion. Maybe, yeah. I think it's yeah, going to be yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, the Aston's image is like sort of in transition at the moment, isn't it? Like mm. with the new V8 Vantage, like they're trying to be a bit more loud and a bit more kind of out there, and it's weird. It'd be interesting to see how they juggle that kind of heritage with the with the new stuff. Well, because another thing, you know, the old uh, well, you've got. Dark green, you've got the mm. lime, and you've got their new title sponsor, Cognizant, who have blue. Does that right, mean that's any a bells? Re- that's a real mess, isn't it, really, in terms well, of colours? 91 sure. Jordan. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, fair. Is those exact, and it's almost the exact same shades as well. I think, yeah, I, I think it's... It um, I'm up for I'm up for anything, really, to be honest. Like, I like loud F1 mm. liveries, like the old um, Benettons and stuff were all sorts mm. of bonkers colours. So, yeah, I'm go for it. Go, go nuts. Why not? Sets. Just well, as long as it's not it not got that pink, the BWT <laughs> pink. Uh, they're gone. In there anyway. Yeah, they're it gone. Would have been, it would have been horrible, wouldn't it? That would have been. Yeah, that would have been shocking. The water, ugly watermelon mm. nonsense. Um, I couldn't believe it. Like, I just, it took me ages to discover that BWT just stands for better water technology. Yeah, it's like best, it's, yeah, it's so lame. Like. Best water technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do like because they sponsor uh, football teams as well. I think they played yeah. like Arsenal in. European Cup recently or something mm. like that but yeah they just they love the pink the pink would have been a bit of a hard sell with that green but um, I think so yeah I think we're done Mike fair enough it's been fun thank you for having me on pleasure mate I've uh, I've yeah this it's been what an hour and well, this has been a long one this is good, one of the longest ones and I the do longer talk the a lot sorry it's my job to talk and so I do talk a bit as is mine now much. so <laughs> yeah. you've got two of us going at it. no thank you Mike honestly I really appreciate you taking the it's time all right. I, think, Keep I didn't know you were on holiday to be honest I, I would have maybe it's not asked great you now, it's but. the only reason I'm having a few beers and stuff because <laughs> I don't have to do work tomorrow so just get rat right asked. and obviously for anyone who wants to check out your stuff I will of course leave links to outside Xbox and anything else like I guess the car, the car final fashion words? stuff would be great yes. uh, as well. Yeah, exactly. If you can link yes, to that, that would be really fun. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, here's to a good 2021 season. Um, and like Please. I said, you know, like I think uh, my, my final message is just that like 
F1 should totally be for everyone. And so let's uh, let's try and welcome in as many fans as we can get. We do. We like, like um, you might not. Be, you might believe the sentiment or not, but we do all race as one. Everyone is Absolutely. entitled to be as part of this sport as anyone else. So. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, thanks again, Mike. Appreciate it, mate. Cheers. And thank you everyone for watching. Goodbye. Ciao, adios. I don't really do an outro. So That's fine. Just finish it here. It's all good. <laughs> Lovely. Cheers, man. Thank cool, you. Cool, no worries.